the last episode. <laughs> oh man, this is crazy. Only the Avatar can master all four elements and bring balance to the world. No! <laughs> Don't let it end. <laughs> oh well. It's been a great journey. Chapter 13, The Last Stand. I feel like she's losing it a little bit. She's enraged. I'm going after Kavira. Are you sure? When you fought Kavira before. I know. She almost destroyed me. Not this time. Yes. You got this, Korra. It's so crazy to look back, think about the whole journey and how far Korra has come and how much she's learned, right? Like she started off as this impulsive child, basically. In her mind, she was the chosen one and she was going to go out there and do great things and bring balance. Etc. Etc. And then she just takes blow after blow after blow, nearly dying, having to watch the world nearly be destroyed. It's crazy. It seems fitting that her final battle is against someone who sees power over everything. Somebody who sees themselves as someone who has the right to impose their will on the world. Nice. Oh, it's lava. That was cool. He has a lava disc, damn. Can we get some last Mako Bolin tag team? I love that we have the two siblings. The two pairs of siblings going off on their own. It's so perfect. I'll deal with this guy. Disable the weapon. Yes, come on, Lynn. I love all these metal bending fights. It's so awesome. work. The outside may be platinum, but we can do a lot of damage in here. <laughs> That's great. I've been so grateful this season to see all these great dynamics really come together. Like, we've had to work <laughs> to get these characters through their their major emotional obstacles, like Suyin and Lin. In many ways, it feels like a payoff, you know, that they can work together. This is what I like to see. It's no malfunction. I can feel someone metal bending inside the arm. Wow, she's good. I lost the connection. The weapon's useless now. Well, that's good. Oh, that's bad. Oh, man. Oh, watch the homeless guy find that gun. If that isn't a Kuvira metaphor, I don't know what is. Literally willing to rip off her own arm for the sake of victory. Fight in the control room. Is that liquid metal? Whoa. I love this music. There you go. I'm ready. Be with you in one I love this lava disc. <laughs> of all things, just a hard shoulder. Three. Nothing's happening. Look, the only thing I know about these vines is that if you mess around with them too much, they explode. True. Get those engineers out of here. No. This is our only way of shutting this thing down. No, 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 no. No. This isn't the time to prove how awesome you are. Thank you. I already know how awesome you are. Right. You're awesome. <laughs> That's so cute. Oh my god, it's such a Mako thing to do. I get where he's coming from. He's not wrong. But no. <laughs> Let's not jump to self-sacrifice so so quickly. Get out as soon as you can. Promise? Promise. Wow. I love you. I love you too. You better make it out. That's so nice. Bolin's rescuing the guards. Oh my god. Good guy, Bolin. Whoa. No, get out of there. Kavira still looks like she's just playing with her. This liquid metal thing is crazy. There you go. Nice, use metal. Good. Alright. I think they made it out. Or at least they survived. You're gonna call off your army and surrender to President Raiko. Then you and- oh! Stop! <laughs> Whoa. This is not how I expected it would go. This is interesting. There's something I've been trying to figure out about Kavira for a while. And I think the backstory episode we didn't get might have cleared some of that up. That's my suspicion. 
it seems like the parallels between Korra and Kuvira have been deliberately set up, but I'm not exactly sure what to make of that. But I think it's interesting that in that fight, they were so evenly matched. Korra didn't really beat Kuvira. Mako kind of beat Kuvira, accidentally. And now, Korra is chasing her into this dark tunnel. I don't know, let's see what happens. Kuvira! Give up! Never. She's too far gone at this point. If you really want to end it, then come and get me! <gasps> oh no. Now it's over. Are you serious? Oh no. Shut it down. I can't. Ah! Oh, is she energy bending it? Is that what's going on? Wow. Wow. A new spirit portal. Oh. Korra! Yeah, where's Korra? Wow, Janor looks so adult. They all really grew up. Korra! In the spirit world? Yeah, so again, they were, Korra's reflection turned into Asami. <laughs> She's still fighting. Why would you save my life after everything I did to you? Yeah. I guess I see a lot of myself in you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. I've gotten a lot of comments that contend that actually it's just Korra's PTSD, but I think it's pretty clear at this point, I mean, Korra just said it, that they're going for the fact that they're, they're similar. We are nothing alike. Yes, we are. We're both fierce and determined to succeed, sometimes without thinking things through. This wasn't how I wanted things to end. If you had all just surrendered, none of this would have happened. That's a really interesting thing for her to say. Like, now that all her plans are crumbling, she's turning to blame. And I like that because that's something that Korra sort of had to get around, right? Like, she had this perfect image of herself and her life and how it was supposed to be. And when things didn't go as planned, you know, when she met obstacles, her first reaction was to get angry at the people around her. And a big part of Korra's growth has come from her challenging her own assumptions and realizing that she is flawed and that she's vulnerable and that the path she wants to follow is not going to be easy. Like no matter what she does, every problem she fixes will create a new problem. And so in a way, she's going to be always defined by the pain and like what pain she's willing to endure to be the avatar. And that's a choice she has to make with open eyes. Kuvira for the longest time, just in her mind, she can't lose. And everything she does is for the greater good. And she's the one who deserves to be the leader of the world, etc. And she's such a zealot in that way. She's literally willing to rip off her own limb or kill people that she cares about. It's interesting because in a way, Korra is talking to herself. You know, this is like Korra's reflection on her own growth. And that's sometimes how things go in real life. You know, like sometimes you don't realize how far you've come until you talk about things to others you see having problems that you used to have. Don't pretend you know what it felt like. The Avatar is adored by millions. I was cast aside by my own parents like I meant nothing to them. How could I just stand by and watch the same thing happen to my nation when it needed someone to guide it? You mm. wanted to create a place where you and your people would never be vulnerable again. Wow. It's a packed conversation. So that was some of Kuvira's backstory. It seems like her motivation is kind of split. Like, on the surface, what she's talking about is justice and helping people. But underneath it, there's this feeling of wanting to belong and being frustrated by feelings of powerlessness. I may not have been an orphan, but believe me, I understand what it feels like to be afraid. That's for sure. After I was poisoned, I would have done anything to feel in control. Mm -hmm. I love Korra in that scene. I love how she's able to be compassionate. Her compassion feels real because we, we know that she's been through that. There's this idea I've heard that you are defined by the pain you are willing to take on in your life. On some level, we have an instinct for things that are dangerous to us, you know, things that we're avoiding, areas that we could improve our lives, areas where we could be better people. But we also have a sense that going down those roads will lead to a life of pain because it will uncover a whole bunch of lies and will be left in a helpless and vulnerable state, at least temporarily. But that's a necessary thing to go through to become stronger because otherwise, the life you've built for yourself is weak. You actually grow weaker over time holding on to lies. Korra initially was that way, right? Like she was so tightly wound to this idea that everything was going to be perfect because she was the avatar. But over and over again, life just smacked her down and that caused a tremendous amount of conflict for Korra and she spiraled into depression. And so Korra embarked on a journey of self-discovery to sort of unravel 
control all the assumptions that she had built about herself in the world, and the result was it made her incredibly weak. Meanwhile, for Kuvira, every time she has a setback, every time she's dealt a major emotional blow, her response is not to take stock in herself and her thoughts, but to double down, and that gives her strength. But what happens is the people who take stock, the people who are willing to go through pain, the people who are willing to examine and sacrifice, those are the people who, in the long run, end up more resilient because their sense of self and their beliefs are built on a stronger foundation, one they've sacrificed for. Whereas people like Kuvira, their house is built on sand. And when the house starts to sink, there's only so much more you can double down and you end up just fighting everything around you. Like Kuvira nearly destroyed herself rather than admit defeat. To challenge your own views, to strip yourself down to the essentials, to continue to improve, to continue to be a fluid person and put down things that you strongly identify with or beliefs you strongly identify with that makes you weak in the short term but makes you much stronger long term i believe and i think that's at least partly what they're going for with cora and Kuvira. spirits are spirits back have returned. right and so is cora and Kuvira. <laughs> you're okay pull in stand down yes this battle is over her power is beyond anything I could ever hope to achieve. Wow. I'll accept whatever punishment the world sees fit. Ah, it's a shame that she did so many terrible things, but it does feel good to me that she at least has this moment. It doesn't make up for anything. It doesn't change the past, but I feel good for her. I feel happy for her that she has let go a little bit. A lot of the show's themes are about letting go, actually. Korra has to let go of her image. Tenzin had to let go of his image. Lin had to let go of her anger for her mother. Asami had to let go of her bitterness towards her father. Zaheer had to let go of his earthly tether. Lots of letting go in the show. You're going to answer for everything you've done. Yeah, as she should. It's cute. And though the battle took a severe toll on our beloved city, out of the destruction, love did bloom. So that is why, dearest friends and family, this is the wedding. Nice. And at times inexplicable bond between Savaric and the Lady <laughs> Julie. Hey, pow. It's a mover. That's great. True love is a fickle creature. You should not have let Bolin be the, <laughs> the pastor. <laughs> I just noticed Milo's sleeping. That's great. Oh, Ginger's there. Everyone's here. Oh, Thank you, Mr. Pabu. Pabu. Damn, I'm gonna miss them. Will you promise to treat her not as your assistant, <laughs> but as your honored and cherished partner? I do take Varric, calluses and all. You may now do the thing. Whoa. That's sweet. That's a nice, nice touch. <laughs> now he's losing it. <laughs> Are you alright? You just make me so dang happy. Uh, alright. Hold it together there, buddy. <laughs> I mean, he's been through a lot. You know, he's been storing up a lot of emotion. It's been an emotional four seasons, or three seasons of Varric, at least. He's been to jail, created weapons of mass destruction, saved the world from weapons of mass destruction, fled various girlfriends, got married, invented movers. It's been a lot. You know, it's probably just all built up. <laughs> what is going on? <laughs> he looks so eager. You ready to get back to Ba Sing Se and finally take the throne? Yeah, about that. Oh. I was actually thinking of stepping down as king and getting rid of the monarchy altogether. Wow. I guess he really took Mako's gift shop talk to heart. Prince Wu, full of surprises. Now, I know what you're going to say. I'm being lazy. I'm afraid of responsibility. I'm putting my singing career before my people. <laughs> singing career. No! I really think the Earth Kingdom would be better off if the states were independent and had elected leaders. Yeah, but the world will be worse off because of your singing. Earth Kingdom democracy is a mistake, if it means Wu having a singing career. And I'll do everything in my power to help you make that happen. Bolin for president! <laughs> Why did my mind go there immediately? The words thank you don't feel big enough for what you did, but I honestly don't know what else to say. Yeah, who said- I remember- I've gotten some comments about how Mako didn't do anything useful. Mako literally was the hero of this episode. Korra was the emotional hero. Mako was like the, the physical hero. He bas He took out the mech, basically. And it was true to character, you know? Him, like, rescuing his little brother, shouldering the burden onto himself. I want you to know, I'll follow you into battle no matter how crazy things get. I've got your back. And I always will. Oh, that's amazing. Remember their first meeting? Mako wouldn't even give her a second glance. How far they've come. I spoke to President yes. Raikou. You've transformed the world more in a few years than most avatars did during their lifetimes. That's for sure. There's so much more I want to learn and do. You don't know how happy I am to hear you so full of hope again. Right. It's been a bit of a bumpy ride, huh? Yeah. 
Life is one big bumpy ride. Yeah, I think that's one of the major themes. There is no heroism without deep pain. Real growth, it comes at a great personal cost. And it's only by acknowledging that and understanding its role, pain's role in life, that allows you to overcome those obstacles rather than burrowing deeper and deeper into lies. That's something I feel Tenzin has authority to talk about because that's something he's also gone through. But I finally understand why I had to go through all that. I needed to understand what true suffering was mm -hmm. so I could become more compassionate to others. Excuse me, Tenzin. <laughs> oh, I wish, that I wish that scene lasted a little bit longer because it was so beautiful. I was getting emotional. <laughs> uh, Tenzin. It's so sad, but also beautiful to look back at the whole journey, like thinking about all that Korra and Tenzin have been through, how they clashed, you know? And part of the reason they clash is because they're similar. They're both stubborn. They both have the way they want to see things and the way they want to do things. But together, through just sheer regard for each other, they like cracked each other's shells and they both became better people. It's such a wonderful thing. And now look where they are, you know, Tenzin's like lovable uncle, you know, lovable dad. And they have like real regard for each other, like real deep regard for each other. The kind of appreciation you, you can only get with people once you've like been to hell and back with them, you know. I love the relationship. Wanna sit with me for a minute? I'm not ready to get back to the party just yet. All right, I'm gonna add a little edit here. I did this actually for the last Airbender finale, so I guess we're making it a tradition. The reason I'm adding this is because I realized later that in the heat of the moment of the show ending, I didn't talk about something really important, which is Korra and Asami. One of the reasons why my reaction to it wasn't that strong is because I had a very strong feeling this would happen. Like I've seen the word Korasami thrown out a lot in the comments. So like a lot of people were commenting previously that I didn't pick up on the signs like Korra blushing when she talked to Asami. I noticed it's just that I kind of already had a very strong feeling that would happen. So it didn't surprise me. Personally, if I have any issue with it at all, it's just the idea that Korra had to end up with someone. I think that it's that feeling, that drive to make sure the characters have someone to end up with is sort of what undermines the romance in the show a little bit. It feels very much like romance has to happen, probably because of the creator's interactions with the fans, I'm guessing, and their experience from The Last Airbender. But that aside, like if she does have to end up with someone, I think Asami is a great choice. There has been a lot of buildup this season between them. They do get along great and they seem to be a pretty good match and they seem to make each other better, which I think is really important and something often missed in romance stories. After I watched it, Dairain on Patreon shared an article with me from Brian where he talks about it a little bit. And there's a part I really like that speaks to this that he quotes from Miyazaki, I think? Yeah, Miyazaki. I've become skeptical of the unwritten rule that just because a boy and a girl appear in the same feature, a romance must ensue. Rather, I want to portray a slightly different relationship, one where the two mutually inspire each other to live. And this is so true. This is something I feel so strongly about TV and movies. I've noticed this has gotten better over the last decade or so. It used to be that there had to be a romantic element, and oftentimes that ended up being the weakest point of the film because it didn't feel organic, it felt contrived. And there is a bit of that here in Korra, but the part about the characters mutually inspiring each other to live, that is something I feel the show does really, really well. This is definitely the case for Korra and Asami, right? They definitely have helped each other, especially this season. But also we see it non-romantically, which I think is really cool too, right? Like Korra and Mako started out as love interests, and they've gone through the whole cycle and they've ended up at a point where they actually just really care about each other. And, Ma and, th and there's a great moment where Mako says that he'll follow Korra into battle, right? That's such a beautiful thing. I really like to see that kind of character growth and that kind of love because that to me is inspiring. All right, end insert. I am so sorry about what happened. Thank you. I'm just glad I was able to forgive him. Let's go on a vacation, just the two of us. I've always wanted to see what the spirit world's like. <gasps> wow, that's a hell of a vacation. Yeah, I feel really sad it's over. I'm realizing now how attached I've become to the characters. I think the ensemble cast is so strong. Like there's just so many characters that I love. I have such a strong feeling about Korra and Bolin and Mako, Asami, Tenzin, but then even the supporting cast is so rich. The kids, Bumi, Varric, Julie, Lin, Suyin, you know, they're all so great. I've been spending so much time with them. You know, I feel like I know them. I would like an epilogue episode just to see them like relax, you know? There is the comics. That's like one thing that gives me hope that I will see them again. There's a little bit more I can get of these characters. There's just so much to say. 
I'll probably save some of it for the Q&A and discussion video, but since this is the end of season four, I'll talk about that a little bit. When I see people talk about the show, I see them mostly mention seasons three or season four as their favorite, but for me, they feel like kind of one season. The two seasons need each other. Season three felt a little bit more fleshed out and complete. My gut feeling about that is it's because season four had budget cuts, like something sort of disappeared. You know, I mentioned Kai's speaking lines just vanished sort of halfway through the season. We didn't get the Kavira backstory episode, which might've made her character more complete. It felt like some things were dropped. That being said, I think the depths of emotion in season four were probably the best in the show and most unique. In many ways, Korra's journey departed from the usual path of the hero and it even departed from itself. We've seen previously, like in season one, Korra had this deep emotional obstacle. She lost her bending. She was on the verge of jumping off a cliff and just like that, Aang like solved the problem for her, you know, like we didn't get that crash. And that's an important element of not only the hero's journey, but also emulating the hero's journey in life and trying to be a better person. Moments of not seeing a clear path forward, moments of not knowing who exactly you are anymore. For me, that's a very important element of the story, you know, the, the hero's story. Being great is difficult and it requires a lot of courage. It requires a willingness to go into dark alleys, you know, and to put up with pain and to strive to be more honest and to listen and to not push people away. I can say that after season four, I love Korra as a character way more than I did before. And she became more beautiful for having emerged from all her terrible hardships with compassion and humility. That's so rare. Overall, it's just a beautiful show. And the only question I have left is why the hell did so many people tell me not to watch this? What's wrong with them? <laughs> if people wanted to critique certain elements of the show, I mean, that's valid. I think there are a lot of good criticisms of the show. But to say this is a bad show is just, there's just so much value in this show to extract. Like to throw the whole thing away. Yeah, it's, it's no, <laughs> it's too much. But anyway, it's been a wonderful journey. When I finished The Last Airbender, I never expected this kind of support from Korra. I'm forever humbled and blown away by the amount of love and support you guys have shown me all this time. Um, I know a lot of you have been here since the last Airbender days, so Thank you so much to you guys and for everybody who discovered me and followed during Korra. Love you guys too. It means so much to me that we can watch these shows together and that you guys are here for like my <laughs> crazy long rants that sometimes go on too long. And the Fruit Saga, which was ridiculous, even though I enjoyed it immensely. I guess what I'm saying is thank you. Thank you to all of you just for being so awesome, for watching the videos, for talking with me in the comments, for being super respectful and cool, even when you disagree with me. It means a lot to me. With every passing series, that goes on. The more I talk to you guys, the more that I do these videos, the more it like restores my faith in humanity and in the internet that people are so cool and so kind and so funny. And you know, it's 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 been really wonderful. You guys really inspire me. And it's it's been such a wonderful thing for me to have this with you guys. So thank you so much. And if you don't plan on following this channel into the next series, I just want to say I wish you guys the best. I wish you all the health, happiness, and success on your own journeys. And hopefully this is not the last goodbye. We still have the two Korra comics thankfully, and then a core Q&A and discussion video, which I'll announce soon and ask for your guys' questions. So stay tuned for that. A huge thanks to all my patrons and to you guys for watching. See you tomorrow. <laughs>